Okay, La Uksumu Bihad al Balad, as we said just very quickly, the we we've discussed at length the oath or the the affirmation that Allah makes about the Balad and what is this Balad and we went through the entire tradition discourses on what the reference means. Um and as you remember Although the translation is very uh, superficial, I swear by the city, we spent a good hour last halakha talking about this one area, La Uqsumu Bihad al Balad. Among the things we said is the sanctified status of Mecca. And the sanctity, something that I didn't emphasize last halakha because of, we, we ran out of time, is whether the sanctity is around the Kaaba itself, in other words, in the haram of the Kaaba, or Mecca, the entire city of Mecca. And of course, to to say it is just the haram, the the area around the Kaaba, runs into a problem, and that is the ayah says la uksumi bihad al balad, balad, balad means city or country or town. And most most scholars. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll summarize a, 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 a long debate. But most scholars said that the sanctity in, extends to beyond the haram, meaning beyond the Kaaba, to the, the town of Mecca as it was defined at the time of the Prophet. Now, this is a. a um, and I said last halakha that you can often take the as a barometer, like the like uh, to the temperature of the ummah, how well or how badly or how good the Muslim ummah is doing, by the extent to which the sanctity of Mecca is observed. Since we talked last halakha and. There were questions. I think it was Khalid who raised these questions. He's not here today, right? Um, since we talked last, uh, since the last halakha, there, there were a couple of things um, that came up. One I talked about in the khutbah. I might have actually mentioned both in the khutbah. I don't remember. But uh, in yesterday's khutbah. Um, this... There was a rebellion in Mecca in 1979, uh, Juhayme, Juhayme or Juhaymin or whatever his name was. Um, does anyone remember what's the, the name of the... Um, Juhayman, yeah, that's right, Juhayman. Uh, who... In ITB, yeah. It, there, there, as, I, as I mentioned yes, yesterday in the khutbah, that there was a documentary in Al Jazeera where they, they interview, they find out the French... Um, uh, special forces that Saudi Arabia hired or engaged to defeat the rebellion in in in, uh, in Mecca uh, by Rahman al Atabi, um, and the in the testimony of these French officers, they said that they witnessed about five thousand. Muslims killed in Mecca in 1979. And as I mentioned in the khutbah, I started calling up Saudi Arabian friends that I trust, and I was told, the, the, these friends told me that actually the, the, this is something that is known in Saudi society, uh, that the Saudi government said that only 300 people were killed, not only, but th th that's what they announced, 300 people but the Saudis who were in the know knew from 1979 that, in fact, uh, Saudi 
the Saudi army started executing Hajij pilgrims because they feared that among these pilgrims are people that belong to the rebellious groups that are hiding. So after they, they defeated the rebellion in Mecca, you know, people that were hold, held as hostages, the pilgrims that were held as hostages were released. They started rushing out of the Kaaba. And according to the French officers and to the Saudi friends who have, who have relatives who are involved in the army and the police and so on, that the, what, what happened was mass executions. Um, the reason I bring this up is that if, in fact, this is true. There was never an investigation, of course. There was a complete cover-up. Uh, the Saudi government refused to let anyone investigate. But if this it is true, that bloodshed spilled in the sanctity of the Kaaba and in the sanctity of Mecca will act as a curse on the Ummah. And it explains a great deal of what we as a Muslim Ummah are going through. Do not think that the, do not take the curse of blood lightly. The fact that something like this could happen, as far as I am concerned, the legitimacy of Al Saud and their administration of the Hijaz and the holy sites became null and void the minute they spilled blood to that extent in the Haram. For the Quran to say, La uqsulu bihaz al balad, wa anta hillun bihaz al balad, and for Muslims to have the idea of spilling any blood in Mecca, not just of human beings, but even animals, was taken to a fanatic degree very seriously for us to reach the modern age where we talk about that type of massacre is mind-boggling. And you cannot be a decent Muslim. As far as I'm concerned, the fact that we have something like this and not a single khutbah that I've heard in the United States or Canada or Britain bother to bring up a massacre of that proportion. And this was, this was just the, the documentary was shown just very recently. Of course, you know, I'm telling my Saudi friends, how, I, I, didn't, if, you, if you knew about this, how is it that we are hearing about it for the first time from the French soldiers who were involved? And they said, well, every Saudi who tried to speak up was promptly arrested and disappeared. And they started telling me stories about this journalist and that journalist and that officer and this. It, it just, as, as a Muslim, I, I have to tell you, when I find other Muslims who tell you, don't, you know, don't talk about it, don't upset people. As a Muslim, I close down towards them. As a Muslim, I feel like we follow different religions. I can't. I, I, I cannot, the idea of that type of blood, when the Prophet ﷺ said from now on, after the the, the 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 revelation of Surat al balad blood cannot be spilled in Mecca. It is mind-boggling. The second thing, I don't know how many uh, have any of you heard this. Um, this uh, you know in Saudi, uh, if you if you put uh, if you um, come out on YouTube, and you say a single word against King Salman you're promptly arrested, right? If you say a, ring, a single word about any of King Salman's policies, the, the parties, the nightclubs, the, the, um, you're promptly arrested. So you can't go out, you can't be on YouTube and, for, and make a recording from Saudi. If you are not arrested, that means that the government approves of what you've said to some extent or another. Because if the government doesn't, you will be arrested. This is a, a very important point. 
So when we have a Saudi guy who visits Israel and comes back to Saudi and says, I've created a Saudi branch for the Likud party and he's not arrested, it means that the government knows about it and is not going to do anything about it. When you have the government arresting Palestinians who've sent money back home to their family members in Gaza and charging with criminal penalties, you know that the government is in a totalitarian fashion. So there was a Saudi woman who, who came out on YouTube announcing to the Muslim world that even if we open up bars in Mecca, oh Muslim world, it's none of your business. You are only entitled to come do your hajj and promptly leave without asking any questions, raising any objections. In other words, the disempowerment and um, disenabling of the entire Muslim world towards what occurs in Mecca as a Saudi as a, a Saudi territory subject to Saudi sovereignty and Saudi will and determination and that the entire Muslim world has nothing to do with what or any say in what happens in the holy sites. Any of you, how many, any of you have heard that recording? It, 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 um, if you're an Arab, you, you would know about it because it, it went everywhere. Or if you know Arabic. Of course, the, 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 she is not. She didn't do this recording on her own. Uh, she was pushed by the Saudi government, and the Saudi government is, in, and they're sending a message to the entire Muslim world that it is none of your business what we do in Mecca and Medina, and that you are only entitled to come do your Hajj, come do your Umrah, and leave, and don't open your mouth. Don't open up your mouth about Jerusalem. Don't open your mouth about the deal of the century. Don't open your mouth about whatever uh, de uh, reconstruction policies because they have a major reconstruction plan. Don't open your mouth about whatever Islamic remains that still exist that we haven't destroyed, that we plan to destroy. Don't open your mouth about the so-called... Um, renovations in that will take place with the, the Zamzam, the, the wall of Zamzam, which, by the way, is, is destroying it. Um, I cannot talk about La Uqsimu Bihaz al-Balad without saying that this is extremely dangerous. Mecca has always been, like Jerusalem, has always been the legacy of the entire Muslim Ummah. It reminds me of Khashoggi when he said that the, when Muslims forsake Jerusalem, it is only a matter of time before they seek Mecca and Medina. And he was completely right on. If you learn Allah, as we talked about last halakha, Allah teaches you that the divine intervenes in the space of the mundane. How Allah teaches you that? By Allah coming and saying, there is this space, this physical territory that I claim as my own, as divine. And there is this time that I claim as my own. That's why we have holy times, right? We have a time, we don't, we don't know why Ramadan or the Eid or Eid al-Akbar or Eid al-Azhar, why these are sanctified divine times other than the will of God. It is the, in this sense is where God comes and says to you, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm re, uh, um, summarizing a great deal of theological thought in Ihya al din that book that Grace was talking about, by the way, is from Ihya al din by Hamid al-Ghazali. Um, uh, 
the, the, just the, the part where he talks about death. In Ihya al-Din, you, you have this long discourse about the idea of sacred space and sacred time. And Allah communicating to human beings, which Allah does throughout, your reason has an enormous role in, your, in discharging your covenant with the divine. In fact, you cannot discharge your covenant with the divine without employing reason. But understand that your reason will have limits. Where are the limits of reason? The limits of reason are exemplified in things like يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْرُوحِ They ask you about the soul, tell them this is something you will never know. This is something that only the divine knows about. So we will never know the secret of the soul. But also the limits of your reason in things that our rational faculties cannot ever justify or explain. Like sacred space and sacred time. It is as if the divine is making an intervention in your mundane existence and say, understand that the, to use our, our language, which human language is always incomplete and insufficient. But it's as if the divine is saying, there is divine reason and there is human reason. And the divine reason is not accessible through human reason. So regardless of how rational and philosophical and mathematical and logical you are, you come to a point where you have to say, I've reached the limits of my territory. And that's the sacred space and sacred time exemplifies that. It's a, it's a, it's a reminder. So why Jerusalem? Why the Israelites? Why the time of Moses? You will never get answers to that because there are no answers to that. Why Mecca as opposed to somewhere in Persia or somewhere, somewhere in Ethiopia where human beings are supposed to have emerged and, and I mean, where, where humanity is supposed to have started? The, the only answer to that is the divine will. And that's, the, so why am I underscoring this? I'm underscoring this because the minute we lose a sense of the sacred in our existence, then we've lost the role of the divine in our existence. So if, if Jerusalem becomes subject to pragmatic calculations of real politics... So, you know, we, we uh, well, you know, it's not practical, that it's not pragmatic that we insist that on the Aqsa Mosque being Muslim because, you know, there's the U.S., there's Israel. The minute you, you give sovereignty to the logic of pragmatism, when it comes to Al-Quds, when it comes to Mecca, when it comes to Medina, you've lost the role of the sacred. And when you've lost the role of the sacred, you've lost the role of the divine. No matter how much you try to rationalize the role, the, the function of the divine, philosophically, you've compromised. It's gone. It's like you've broken the, 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 the seal. Once the seal is broken, then you're, it's a slippery slope. The logic of pragmatism, when it prevails over the logic of the sacred, it's a slippery slope and it has no end. So we started out initially by destroying the, the, the grave sites of the companions and saying, well, you know, we need space, they're not sacred and the homes of the companions, and the homes of Ali al-Bayt. But once the logic of pragmatism prevailed over the sacred, we've become philosophically compromised. And once you are philosophically compromised, no matter what you do to try to make things 
flow again, you cannot until you recognize the error in the first place. So I emphasize this for all these Muslims who say, what is wrong with our ummah? Why is it what we are in the state we are in? Go back to the elementary alphabet. Use philosophy to understand your, your existence. Philosophy is not an evil. Philosophy often allows you insight. And re-examine the relationship between the sacred and the mundane. And if you have no sacred in your psychology, if in your psychology you simply think that there is no place, no space for the sacred, then in fact you have no God in you. Then in fact you might think you believe that in fact you've compromised the divine and you've ejected the divine from inside of you. Now, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm telling you, you can take it as, you know, I, I can sit and I can tell you the lineage of the theological perspective. But the names matter little. What matters is when you hear what I'm saying, like when I've heard it, when I've read it and, and studied it, it is the truth. It has the ring of the truth. There's something that tells you in it, yes, the sacred must play a role. And when the sacred claims territory, that territory must be sovereign. And its sovereignty means that it is shared by human beings, shared in this case, shared by Muslims. And it cannot be the sovereign, it cannot be the tutelage of a single family. It cannot be Al Saud that decides what happens to sacred space. It must be a collective inheritance to the sovereignty of Muslims. Now, listen. You know, a lot of students over the years they say, you know, yeah, but all of this theoretical. What can we do? That that is not your role. Allah, what Allah asked of you, is to testify for what the truth is not to testify for what, what, what is pragmatic and practical. Allah didn't ask you to be a politician. Your shahada is not about politics. Allah didn't say, you know, take your shahada according to what. And Allah didn't ask you to be a faqih to talk about, well, what maslaha is. I've studied law my entire life, and what I can tell you after studying law for my entire life, is that I am very hesitant to speculate about law. It amazes me that people who've never studied law, all Muslims, pretend to be fuqaha, talking about, well, what is the rule of sharia per maslaha, when in fact they know nothing about either maslaha or sharia. Don't be a lawyer, leave law, because law sometimes could be a very unethical thing. If you haven't studied law, mastered law, your ethics are gone. Law, bad lawyers are unethical. And the reason they're unethical is because they're bad lawyers. And law teaches you to be without ethics unless you master it. If you're a true philosopher of law, then you know what the role of ethics is in law. But go to any, any ambulance chaser lawyer. I defy you to find an iota of ethics. But you go to true masters of law, meaning big, accomplished legalists, and you find that they are keenly ethical. It is because they understand the real nature of law. Why I'm saying this is that when we make ourselves into all either politicians or lawyers and think that our shahada is what Allah expects for us is to do our shahada, shahada is what we attest to as Muslims, is what is functional per the demands of politics or demands of law, that is where we become destroyed as an ummah. Testify to the truth, leave politics and law that is, that is not your function and it's not what Allah wants you to testify to.
So when we when, when I say that is the place of the sacred, I cannot talk about la uqsul bi bihaza al-balad wa anta hillun bihaza al-balad when Allah affirms the sacred and we ignore the sacred in every day of our existence. And then you, you I, I don't know if, if, I mean, American Muslims seem to be oblivious to, to Jerusalem and oblivious to what happens in Mecca and oblivious to what happens in Medina. And, you know, if they can get all, go to just to Umrah or Hajj, they, they go and come out and... and it, okay, enough about, about that because um, we could... I could spend another few hours uh, going off on the, 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 the you know, you, the, these are huge philosophical slash theological issues, but I've summed up about a thousand years of debates and discourses and so on in, 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 in a nutshell. And that's Sayyid. That's what you take out and take away from it after you spend a lifetime, a lifetime studying. What time is it? Okay, it's a short frame. I still insist we'll finish Surah Al Balad. I, I, I'm, inshallah, inshallah. May Allah give me the madad and, and the focus. Ya Rabb. So, Bismillah um, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. One of my one of my teachers once told me um, your relationship to the divine is is like the relationship of a leaf to its branch. That wherever you are, Allah is is with you. You are healthy, your soul is healthy as long as it is attached to the branch, as long as you as a human being are cognizant of your relationship like a leaf to a branch. You are full of grace, of barakah, full of blessing. The problem is, is that so many of us detach from the branch. We even fall to the ground. We could even dry up and crumble, and we continue thinking that we are alive and healthy. If you put that image in your mind, and actually we used to do it as an exercise, we would visualize a, a leaf growing out of a branch and visualize us being that leaf, nourished and sustained and preserved by that branch. And then we would often even say, like, you know, be careful not to fall off for the for that leaf to fall off the branch if you feel allah you then you feel that you are like that leaf to a branch and you you feel that you are an extension you are a growth uh, because i you know often people ask well, what does it mean to love allah it means to the extent that the leaf can love the branch, it, it is becomes aware of its dependence and its the reality of its own existence as an entirely dependent and a a product of that branch. That's what love is to the divine. Awareness of that. It is not 
the Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood has done a lot to ch to to. Um, Hollywood has done a lot to corrupt our notions of lo of love, so that love becomes you know googly eyed and wet lips and a French kiss. Um, that concept of of of, of, of love is um, is its own cultural byproduct. Anyway, okay, so there's something to 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 think of, and it. it Reflect on it and see where it takes you. I mean, each of us goes through their own journey. Um, and we talked about at length about the ins and outs of, uh, and you are dwelling in this city, so I'm not going to repeat our the entire thing about the, the grammar of you are dwelling or you will dwell in the city and whether the surah is Meccan or Medinan and if it's Meccan then how could it say you are dwelling in the city when in fact at the time uh, he wasn't dwelling I'm sorry if the, if the surah is in Medinan before Mecca was conquered uh, then how can say you are dwelling in the city when in fact he wasn't dwelling in the city and we've talked about all of that and al hadr al mustaqbal siyan عند Allah the sense of of present and past and future is very different for the divine than it is for us Allah often speaks in the Quran about present events in the past tense and future events in the present tense and that's because of the nature of time for the divine and the nature of the way the divine speaks to us about time. Um, and again, the, the, the literal translation, and by the parent and the offspring, and we spoke about that, right? Okay. And the most important thing that, the, the most critical thing to emphasize in the, that qasam, to swear by, the, the parent and the offspring or the process, the, 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 the reality of um, um, not parenthood, but the reality of, of preservation and, and continuation of uh, humanity through that process of birth is what the Ultimately, most Muslim scholars emphasize is takrim bani Adam or the honoring that by, when Allah swears by the walid wa ma walad, the, the, the parent and the offspring, Allah is in fact swearing by the sanctity of human beings. And, and uh, the, the Arabic here is, is important because you always have people who uh, have been um, ruined by by the, the uh, skepticism of their age فَيَكُونَ الْقَصَمْ بِجَمِيعِ الْأَدَمِيِّينَ صَالِحُمْ وَطَالِحُمْ so that when um, in fact that Allah is swearing by the sanctity of humanity جَمِيعِ الْأَدَمِيِّينَ صَالِحُمْ وَطَالِحُمْ whether they are good or bad so whether they are in fact believers or non-believers. And as I said in the past halakha, historically it is amazing. In that time, at a time where the idea of the worth of a human being was often determined by their tribal uh, identity, by their familial identity, by their genealogy, by their relationship to the um the by the relationship to to uh, dynasty to the relationship to the king or queen or uh, or lords or so on the idea of the human beings as human beings whether good or bad whether believers or non-believers have a sanctity was historically radical and it was not known in Greek philosophy 
and it was not known in after Greek philosophy, the idea itself that human beings as sanctified as a human beings that they have, there's a sanctity to humanity, um, was quite radical. Regardless of whether then what Muslims were able to do was the concept, that's not the issue. The issue that the idea itself is radical. And of course, in our day and age, the age of post-human rights and all of that, uh, it doesn't strike us as radical because we, we all grow up with the concept as, as a natural concept. But it is important to recognize that when the Quran emphasized the sanctity of humanity as humanity, that it was a moment in history, an important moment. Okay, so I think we we then stopped at what لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ Is that right? Okay. Uh, so, for but for instance, لأن حرمة الخلق كلهم داخل كلهم داخل في هذا الكلام that حرمة الخلق the the sanctity of of الخلق the sanctity of creation and the sanctity of humanity. Of course, the, the, you know when when uh, the the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that that. Uh, the the murder of a single believer is more grave to in the eyes of God than the than the destruction of the Mecca of of the Kaaba itself. I mean, it all underscores the idea of the sanctity of life and the sanctity of creation, which, in my view, is what in fact propelled the Islamic civilization. It's what allowed the Islamic civilization to be born, um, because. The early Muslims were motivated and animated by the idea of worth, that creation has a worth and that it is not purposeless and it's not pointless and it's not without um, a, a cause that justifies it and explains it and in fact makes it worth the investment. And that's often what propels civilization. Okay. Okay, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ This translation says, we have created man into a life of toil and trial. Of course, you notice here that the, that the Quran says, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ Human beings. Insan is human, humanity or human beings. The translation says man. So just, you know, you know. Um, Okay, so kabad, um, in Arabic we say kabid al-rajul kabdan fahuwa kabdun. Kabid al-rajul kabdan fahuwa kabdun. A man has, a man has, Toiled in a a in a in a, in a, a um, strenuous way, so the man has become exhausted. Now the origin of this of this expression is kabid is a word that connotes anything that produces exhaustion. Um, uh, uh, Ta'ab wal mashaqqa, exhaustion, um, hardship, um, uh, hard work, and the origin of it comes from the word kabid, deliver. The idea that you, that there, this is an, an old belief that the, the energy that animates a human body came from the liver. Now, of, of course, I don't know if, if medically that makes any sense. I'm not, I don't know anything about medicine. Um, but that was the, the old sort of mythical belief that it, the source of energy animates the body comes from the kabid. And from that evolved in Arabic the entire, a, a whole slew of expressions that 
Kevin is is anything that confronts you with a challenge that leads to exhaustion and exertion. So when Allah says, is Allah saying that humanity, that human beings have been created to confront a life of hardship and exertion. The most interesting discussion from all the tradition here There, there are two related interesting points, actually. Uh, is that, is God referring to the process of creation, the, the process, in other words, of the birth of a human being, that the human being, when they, are, when they develop in a fetus and then they're born, that this is the mukabada that Allah is referring to. Is this the... The, the the transformative process of hardship and and hard work that is Allah referring to, or is Allah making a comment about the nature of our existence on this earth? Now, why would it make why does it make a difference? The minority school that said that this refers to the process of um, development of a fetus and birth. Um, that's a minority school. They basically say that Allah is reminding us that, in fact, we come to this earth through a miraculous process of development that would take a divine intervention to, to create, that nature would not be able to create something miraculous like the process of development and birth. That's the minority school. The majority school said that no, in fact, Allah, especially because of what comes later in the same surah, what, what follows, that Allah is, is underscoring that human beings, from the moment they are born, the first state of consciousness that they have is how to avoid pain that we are born, what we know is how to, we feel hunger, we don't want to be hungry anymore. We feel thirst, we don't want to be thirsty anymore. We feel cold, we don't want to be cold anymore. We feel heat, we don't want to be hot anymore. That our first, that our need, state of na nature, state of creation, is that we respond to impulses of pain and hardship. And we respond to these impulses by trying to alleviate them. And in fact, much of our existence, as the theologians then often comment on this, this area, is that much of our existence can be explained by our state of anxiety about avoiding and creating a buffer zone between us and pain. So we amass wealth to make sure that we can afford the doctor when we want doctor. We can buy them food regardless of how expensive the food gets. We can buy clothes whenever, whatever protective clothes we would need for us and our family. That our state of consciousness becomes then from the first state of we want to avoid pain to developing to a, a further state of anxiety about pain. That تعويذ الألم الوجود والأصل هو العالم الألم وسعي الإنسان لانتفاء الألم and so this this is the, the some of the the Arabic that is uh, now. What is an elevated soul? An elevated soul is a soul that develops a consciousness that thinks in terms beyond the mere aversion of pain and anxiety about pain. The, elsewhere, the difference between in nafs al and in nafs al 
the soul, the nafs, which is not really a soul but consciousness. Nafs is consciousness. The nafs, the, the most basic nafs, which thinks in terms of maximizing utility because of the need to averse pain, and then the aspirational nafs, the aspirational consciousness, which thinks in terms of principles that might even get to the point of sacrificing itself for the sake of others. And that comes later in the surah when Allah then tells us, in fact, you take care of others. You take care of the orphan, you take care of the needy. You are no longer in the state of the mukabada because the state of mukabada is when you are not, in fact, concerned about taking care of others. You are concerned about taking care of number one. So, again, from because what Grace said just ignited a lot of memories in, in my mind when she said that, you know, everything passes and even our meetings will eventually pass and it will become part of history and part of memory. And, you know, it just becomes... So I started remembering all my... my my, you know, the the past that I long for and the moments that, and I remember one of my teachers when he said that, that said uh, about uh, Surah Al Balad, he was commenting on Surah Al Balad, and he he made the comment that uh, you can in fact use that as a barometer for the health of your own consciousness of your own nafs. Are you basically? prone to thinking of aversion of pain and maximizing your utility in order to avert pain? Or do you think in terms of principles that are beyond the aversion of pain? And in, in, in the comment he made is that that could often be a yardstick to the, to the extent to which your soul has matured. Is your soul ilahi, divine, or your soul like that leaf that has detached from the branch and fell. It is no longer prone to the divine. It looks at money and looks at bank accounts and says, well, that's security for me. That's the mukabada. That's, that's the, 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 the nafs and mukabada. And nafs, the, the, the most base. The one that looks at money and says, it's not mine. It belongs to God. And what can I achieve with it? That's the nafs al-mutma'inna. That's, that's the nafs that has elevated beyond. So Allah's comment on لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ the, 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 the very basic nafs at the moment of born, the, the, the immature nafs, the immature nafs which feels hunger like a baby, like a child, can only respond to self-interest and basic utility. Allah's comment is to remind us um, I'm just making sure I haven't uh, yeah, um, is to remind us that أَيَحْسَبُ أَلَّا يَقْدُرَ عَلَيْهِ أَحَدْ Before I got, get to أَيَحْسَبُ أَلَّا يَقْدُرَ عَلَيْهِ أَحَدْ For those of you, because I always get those who are interested in Arabic and they say, you know, why don't you explain more Arabic grammar and then also at the same time, people say, when you explain Arabic grammar, you completely lose us, and we're not really interested in that at all. So, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, when in Arabic, by the way, when you, you say, just a little bit of Arabic eloquence, um, when you say, Fulanun uh, kabid, uh, kabid, or Rajulun kabid, or Muhammad kabid, you're not actually talking about someone's liver because uh, one of my uh, I saw a student once who translated this uh, Muhammad's liver hurts him. No, no. Muhammad kabid means if someone is um, is a hothead, that's what you call a, a, a kabid, a, a person who is a kabid, a, a hothead, a, a person who's full of jealousy and you know if you if you're constant if you uh, get all heated up about your honor and your dignity you're a kabid in in arabic expression 
my apologies to those who don't like it when I get into the Arabic stuff. Um, one of the interesting, I mean, I you always have to skip over a lot of stuff, but one of the interesting things that I've read in, in the traditions about uh, uh, you find in the in the books of Akbar and Hadith especially, they talk about a man uh, uh, who we don't we don't know much about, except that his kunya, his uh, the name the given name to him was Abu Al Ashad, and the the reason he sort of became famous is Abu Al Ashad, who was one of companion one of the companions, supposedly he was extremely strong, and he was often described as Rajulun Kabid, a, a, a hothead. Um, I don't know. I hope I'm not wasting time with this. But anyway, Abu Al Ashad would uh, reportedly uh, there were among the mo the strongest sandals you could buy at the time, and also the most uh, thought over sandals because shoes and sandals at the time were very important. So you'd be surprised how, how much in Arabic you find in Arabic poetry about footwear. By the way. A lot of Arabic poetry about footwear um, at the time of the Prophet. So Abu Ashad would would get would buy these Sudanese sandals, who were very known, or, or Abyssinian sandals, or also called uh, uh, Habashiya, um, and would reportedly stand on them, and people would then try to pull the sandals from under him. And he would stand so firmly and he was so strong that the sandals would rip from under him before slipping out. Um, so among the, so the akhbar, the reports that you find in the tradition, you always find very strange things. And if you don't have an intellect, you could really get lost. That's why the literalists always become stupid because <laughs> they get so... One of the things you read is reportedly was revealed to comment about Abu Ashad and his Sudanese sandals. Now, of course, that's completely false. That's a complete invention. But if you're a literalist and if you go only by Isnad, you could teach your students as actually one, some of the halakhas back in the good old days in Egypt, uh, we, one of the, the shuyukh of the halakas used to teach his students that the occasion for revelation for is Abu al-Ashad and his Sudanese sandals, <laughs> his torn Sudanese sandals. And, you know, but anyway. Um, Abu al-Ashad takes part in several battles, by the way, um, uh, and he reportedly was a formidable force because he would refuse to carry shields and he would fight with two swords. Um, you don't have full names? Huh? You don't have full names? I actually don't know his real name. I don't think his real name is wrong. And that's why you can't find much about Kutub, in Kutub Rijan about him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Allah's comments about لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبِدْ or according to the Akhbariyun about Abul Ashad, which is... But no, but, uh, we've created human being in, in, in this natural state of hardship is أَيَحْسَبُ أَنْ لَا يَقْدُرْ عَلَيْهِ أَحَدْ that does ultimately... Um, it's the first you know, literal translation. Does he think, does human beings think then that no one has power over them? Um, that's istifham ala sabil al inkar. In other words, that's a rhetorical question. Not uh, so. The only thing to say about this, because the, the literal meaning, I think, for the most part. Um, If human beings are not mindful of the divine, 
and we saw this, by the way, in the birth of utilitarian philosophy. That the, all of this was was the Quran was revealed long before utilitarian philosophy. So when Muslim theologians were commenting on it, I would have loved to see what they had would have said if they were created after the birth of utilitarian philosophy. But that when if human beings are simply utility based and utilitarians, then it is inevitable that their relationship to principles would become power prone. So that their notion of ethics would be tied, their notion of morality would be tied to simply who can achieve maximum utility and who cannot achieve maximum utility. And being conscientious of al-qudra al-ilahiyya, the divine power, is conceding that human power itself is not the yardstick for right and wrong. So, in you know, among the theologians who are philosophically prone, they would often comment that this affirms the 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 right the the fact that al muallim al kabir who we said the muallim al kabir the big teacher was aristotle that aristotle was correct in his concepts of his notion of ethics and the relationship between ethics and power not all theologians were aware of aristotelian philosophy but those who were would often comment about the nature of aristotelian philosophy of course, for me, it, 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 I, I would have loved to see what these theologians would have written if they were born after the birth of pragmatism and um, utilitarian philosophy and the attempts, the, the rather extensive attempts at deconstructing absolute ethics or what we're known as Aristotelian philosophy and Aristotelian virtue. I don't want to get too philosophical on you, but my point is that all of this could be connected to a very important discourse that when you talk about divine power, you are not simply saying, well, you know, as, as a lot of Muslims do these days, well, inshallah, if Allah wills, if, you know, if Allah, but to internalize the idea of divine power would translate is enough into nafs al mutma'inna to the tranquil soul, the the anxious soul that Grace was talking about, incidentally, is by its nature something that has not become aware or conscious or or, or um, sufficiently um, uh, permeated by the awareness of divine power. It's the leaf that has forgotten the branch. So Muslims who live in a life of realism and pragmatism and do not work out al-qudra al-ilahiyya, what divine power means. When Allah says, ahad, you think that that Allah is not the ultimate power, and Allah relates it to mukabadat al-insan, to the state of, of uh, let's call it the primitive state of human beings as responding only to stimulus of pleasure and pain. That is Allah, as if Allah, at the same time, speaking very simply to you, so that the most unsophisticated human being can understand what Allah is saying. But also Allah at the same time speaking very philosophically to you. Because you, you could spend your entire lifetime studying philosophy and then ultimately say, oh yeah, well, the, the entire 20 years or 30 years I've spent read, reading philosophy have all been captured in these two ayat. That's my own experience because I did spend 30 years of my life reading philosophy. The outside library can, is, a, is a very... Um, very good record of all the philosophical books that I've read, and they're organized according to, unless Ziyad changed the, the organization, hello Ziyad if you see this, uh, unless Ziyad altered the organization, they're all organized according to the, uh, when I read what. So the, uh, 
they sort of track 30 years of, of philosophical journey. And ultimately, these two verses basically summed up. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, my uh, for those who are interested in Arabic, because Arabic, uh, by the way, I, because I forgot, in Arabic, some students have read in the past Ahd Labid, and they said, what, what the heck does Ahd Labid mean? Uh, when in, in Arabic, when you say Ahd Labid, it means old times. It doesn't mean the hard time or hard times of hardship. It just means old times. And that developed in, in Arabic expression because that's the way it was used in poetry. I'll, tr I'll try to limit my, you know, points of Arabic eloquence and grammar and so on invade my brain and and sometimes they, they sneak out, sometimes not, because I don't want to alienate all you guys and for you then to disappear. And, um, okay, I, 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 I tell you one story about uh, um, and a story about a, a, a man who was known uh, as Abu Ashad al Jamahi. And it was also said that it was Nudar bin al Harith who the story, and that you often find in the traditions that we're not sure who exactly an event occurred. But the event went something like this that when Surah al, al Balad was revealed, um, and among, this is a story that is often report, report, reported or repeated in the context of what takes place about the revelation of Surah Al-Balad. Uh, Abu Al-Ashad Al-Jamahi, who I think it was, in, in fact, happened with, uh, goes to the Prophet والسلام, and he said, I've committed this sin and that sin. We don't know what sins he's committed. We, the, the tradition doesn't tell us. And the Prophet والسلام, said, and he said, how do I repent for this sin? And the prophet recites Surah Al-Balad again. It was not the occasion for revelation. It was an occasion for the prophetic recitation, which we use then, then in tafsir, when the prophet recites a particular ayah and in response to it. And the, the prophet said, you know, haven't, haven't you heard Surah Al-Balad? And then he recites, um, and he said, the... the the, your repentance is either sadaqah or to free a soul. Atq or sadaqah. And apparently that according to the traditions that Abu al-Ashad al-Jamahi had committed several sins and every time he goes to the Prophet and the Prophet told him you either have to pay sadaqah and or you have to free a soul, free a person. So Abu Ashad al-Jamahi tells the Prophet, Isn't it possible that I do something else other than that? Because Abu Ashad, what Abu Ashad al-Jamahi was talking about is that he wanted to repent by saying Astaghfirullah. That's what he wanted the Prophet to tell him. Is that go say Astaghfirullah, ask God for forgiveness. But he didn't want to give money. He's given, he's committed enough sins in the past. And on three or four occasions, he had to give money or free slaves. And reportedly, he had to free slaves and he, until he became slaveless. He gave up all his three slaves. And now he was at the level of, of just the, the sadaqah. So he then goes, goes around complaining, bitching about it. Excuse my experience. And he says, Wallahi ma alam illa أني لإن دخلت في دين محمد إن مالي لفي نقصان من الكفارات والنفقات. By God, now he's complaining to friends, right? And he says, ever since I followed Muhammad, ever since I followed this prophet, my money keeps decreasing <laughs> from all the kafarat, all the money in repentance I've had to pay. And of course, he doesn't find very sympathetic ears, unlike a lot of Muslims today whom you might find some really bad friends who would sympathize with you when you complain about 
doing what's good and urge you to do what's wrong. Uh, the 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 story goes on to say that depending on the, the version, who, whether it, some uh, uh, that the, the compared basically walk away from him according to some versions or Naharu tell him you know what's wrong with you man why you the the, the reason I think the the, the story is well, worth mentioning. Um, Note here that the way we've, because we always choose what we emphasize from the tradition and what we don't emphasize, we are constantly in an interpretive and a creative mode. Don't believe anyone that simply tells you they tell you what history is the way it was. And our interpretive mode has emphasized the response to sin is to tawbah by going and saying to Allah, speaking to Allah and saying, Allah forgive me, and istighfar. We have not emphasized in our interpretive mode the traditions like the traditions of Abu al-Ashad al-Jamhi that says that the first response to sin is kafara by spending money in other words, why do you spend money? Why do you free a slave? Because you want to discipline the base self, the base self that responds to stimulus of pleasure and pain, and that does not, when you say to Allah, astaghfirullah, orally, you are still trapped within the base self. Because you could say astaghfirullah, but as long as it's the istighfar doesn't cost you anything, you have not resisted your stimulus to pleasure and pain. Does everyone follow what I'm saying? So, the, in fact, in our tradition, and it's a, it's a part of our tradition that it's, it's a travesty that we have de-emphasized the way... Uh, not Wahhabi Islam, because this happened before Wahhabi Islam. I mean, long before Wahhabi Islam. But the way that we have de-emphasized the parts of our tradition, prophetic tradition, that emphasizes the way you discipline the self is through sacrificing material. And in our modern age, I cannot emphasize this enough. Because our mode as Muslims is we have become so addicted to words until words lost their meaning. And we, we cannot, you know, you can, we, we cannot just lose sight of the fact that, you know, the biggest donors are Christians and Jewish and, and or, or without religion. Even the biggest, look at the, the donors in, in uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Look at the donors in the Mormon tradition. Look at the donors in uh, uh, Scientology. The worst donors on the face of this earth are Muslims. Bar none. Look at Muslim institutions and their funding. Have you ever done just a field trip to the building, the Scientology building or the, in L.A. or the Jehovah's Witness? We, we as Muslims have nothing unless it comes from corrupt politics money. Power money is corrupt. That's not what Allah is talking about. Money that comes from, from the, the state of Muqabala, the pious Muslim who says, I put money in Allah's cause, fi sabilillah, is blessed money. And blessed money cannot be compared with the cursed money of power and politics. Again, you want to understand why Quds is in the state it is, why Mecca is in the state it is, why Medina is in the state it is? Because of corrupt politics money. It is not blessed money. Blessed money comes out of the pocket of a believer, not out of the pocket of a politician. Until our money starts coming out of our, the pocket of the believer, whether we do it grumping like our friend... Um, you know, complaining and grumping. And ultimately, even if he's complaining and grumping, but, but, uh, but he still gave the money. But of course, he had a community that would, 
he would have been ostracized if he didn't give the money. Unfortunately, in our communities, no one ostracizes you for for being rich and um, selfish. And they should. Um, I, I don't want you to tell you, well, Grace and maybe in her talks will tell you some of the stories of my failure to kiss up to rich people um, in the various times that I was introduced to rich people to do proper butt kissing, excuse the language, and my my absolute abysmal failure in do so because all I told them is, well, give if you want to please Allah. And they look at me like, well, we don't, you know, okay, are you going to tell us how wonderful and we are and how we're God's gift to the world? And yeah. Um, okay. What time is it? Okay. Discipline Khalid. Gershaw says, you know, it's once in a lifetime, and if we don't get, get, if we don't unload the data in your brain, then, so she's always telling me that, it's like, okay. أَيَحْسَبُ أَنْ لَا يَقْدَرَ عَلَيْهِ أَحَدْ يَقُولُ أَهْلَكْتُ مَالًا لُبَدًا Although I assume you all have translations with you, but, um, he says, I have spent enormous wealth. The interesting point here is in the word lubada, because Quranic terminology is always fascinating. Um, Lubad is things that accumulate on top of things until they reach a height. So a human being, when they think in terms of money, they think of what, how much has been spent. And by the, the, the base self thinks of, well, if expenditures are the way they are, how can I be secure that the income, that what will be coming, would in fact equalize the expenditures? And that is where the expression "ahlaktu man al lubada" is fascinating because man al lubada, not only a lot of money, which the, the literal translation, but it has the sense of ambiguity and a sense of longing and loss. So if you tried to, to take out another word to express our relationship with money and replace it with another, you can't find a better expression. It's, it's, if you're into the eloquence of Arabic, it's endlessly fascinating. Man and Lubada, which by the way, is the first time it's been, you, I, I, in Arabic poetry, the word Lubad is used, but Man and Lubada, was never used. So it's endlessly fascinating. Our relationship with money is simultaneously an ambiguous, longing, love-hate relationship, all captured in this simple expression, man and lubada. It's amazingly perfect. You couldn't put another. Okay, to, enough about uh, Arabic. It is said also, just to be thorough, um, that among, you always get competing narrations about occasions of revelations. Um, it is said that Al-Nudar ibn Harith that Anfaqtu Mad al-Lubada was revealed in response to Al-Nudar ibn Harith that Al-Nudar ibn Harith would, be, would brag before reportedly converted to Islam that uh, he had spent enormous amount of money fighting the Prophet and fighting Muslims. 
And then you find reports that says, well, this this is commenting about al Mudar ibn Haris. Um, don't put too much weight on that report. Just so you know, because if you look at especially the tafsir books that are hadith prone, they'll tell you the occasion for the revelation of this ayah is al Mudar ibn Haris and his money that he spent against the Prophet ﷺ and so on. Okay. يَقُولُ أَهْلَكْتُ مَالَ اللُّبَدَ يَحْسَبُ أَنْ لَمْ يَرَهُ أَحَدْ Again, a rhetorical question. Does a human being think that the way that a human being deals with money, um, that no one sees him? Obviously, the one who sees here is Allah. And the one you... So the important point that among the things that were raised here that are of interest is those like Hamd al-Ghazali in his Ahiyya Alum al-Din who says um, that human beings by nature are secretive about, there are few things Hamd al-Ghazali says human beings by nature are secret about, about love, sex and money are prime among them. And uh, human beings do not normally like people to know how much they earn and precisely what they spend on. So when Allah reminds you that you are in fact do not have any privacy in your relationship with money. That this is a particularly a point to be underscored by the divine. Do not think that in your relationship with money that you do not have a keen observer who is who sees your entire relationship and the truth of what it is even if you are able to hide it from the closest people to you, because human beings sometimes hide their relationship with money, even to with their spouses, their children, their parents, in other words, the closest human beings to you. And it is something that to reflect on, that our relationship with money, especially when it becomes a diseased relationship, becomes the more disease there is, the more secretive it becomes, the more we in fact hide it from all, even the closest people to us. Something to reflect on. All of these are ways that you can check your on the, the, the well being of of your own health, the health of your own nafs. Uh, my mother, who was a psychologist, would often, I mean, of course, that, that was a, she was a bit of a troublemaker. May Allah bless her soul. She would often, when women would come for counseling, she would often tell them that if your husband refuses to tell you how much money he makes or hides from you how much money he spends, that that is a sure sign of shaitan in your relationship. Of course, they would leave and have fights with their husbands. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, just, may Allah bless you. Allah yirhamah wa yassam. Yeah. Okay. أَلَمْ نَشْعَلْ لَهُ عَيْنَيْنِ وَلِسَانَ وَشَفَتَيْنِ Have we not given human beings the eyes, the two eyes, and a tongue, and a pair of lips? Is it significant that Allah reminds us especially of the eye, and the tongue, and the lips? You reflect on it for a second, and I think the answer is obvious. It is what we see, what we speak, and what we speak, the words and perception. And which, which have an intimate relationship with our najd, with our, with our relationship, with the nature of good 
and evil. And, and this 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 all builds like a, like um like you you're 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 creating a portrait that will come at the end to deliver a full picture. So, Alam Allahu Walisanan Washafatain that Allah reminds us with the obvious that do you think that what you see and what you utter and the relationship between what you see, in other words, your senses, your perception. Between your perception and how you translate that perception into spoken words. Spoken words means how you attest and testify to the truth. Because in Islamic theology, shahada is shahada, your, your testimony, your, how you attest and what you attest to. When you speak, you attest. When you act, you attest. Everything you do or you say, you are testifying. And ultimately, what you are held responsible for in the hereafter and after your death is what you've attested to. And you've, what you've attested to through your words and through your behavior. So if Allah allowed you the opportunity of perception, hear the eyes, but what the various opportunities of perception that Allah, Allah allowed you, meaning the various opportunities of understanding, were translated into testimony, into shahada, that ultimately was deceitful, deceitful or hypocritical, meaning that there was inconsistency between what you've perceived and what you've spoken and what you've done. That sums up the state of your nafs and the health and well-being of your nafs and in turn your accountability. So what is it that we will answer to? And I say the moment of death is where it gets very serious and very real. Is what opportunities you were given by name? What opportunities here, not literally, because all the Mufassirin, even the literalists, had to concede that it is not literally simply what you see by the eye, but what you see by the intellect, because the eyes are simply doorways to the intellect. So, to, to bring a rather obvious point, I don't exactly remember who said it, but say, if it was al Ainain literally, then this ayah would say nothing to the blind person person who doesn't see. So Allah is saying Ainain to, to signify seeing through the intellect. What opportunities you were given in life to perceive and to comprehend. Let's say you were given no opportunities to perceive or I had an uncle who suffered from Down syndrome. That, what this uncle perceived is very different in terms of the accountability of this uncle than what I perceived. In the interest of time, I'm, I'm sort of in a very vulgar way, sort of summarizing a great deal of discourse. Perception is intimately connected to your level of accountability and what you will be held to account for. So in the in their, the example, they would often say, "My apologies to my children, the son of a sheikh, or the daughter." I will add, the son of a daughter of a sheikh's accountability would be very different than, than the son or a daughter of the owner of a, a not a very good place. By because for them. Son and daughter was intimately connected to who you are, of course, by the uh, The idea is that the opportunities that you are given will make a huge difference as to what Allah expects your shahada to be through your words and deeds. And if there is discrepancy between your words and your deeds, between what you said you believed and what you've, the way you've acted out your belief, that's where your nafs becomes in serious trouble. Our teachers used to, I, I had one of my teachers, especially Sheikh Adil Aid, used to say, I beg you children, of course you're not my children, but 
you, see, you would say, I beg you children, hold yourself, hold yourself accountable before you're held accountable, which is a, a, a paraphrasing of a, of a hadith of the Prophet I beg you to, to reflect upon your perceptions, your words, and your deeds before it happens and you will have no escape from it. And for those of us who we used to res respond, and I can't claim that, you know, although the percentage of response was much higher than the percentage of response you would think from the place. But, of course, you know, some of us didn't. Um, but those of us who did respond, we would do sleepless nights thinking about, in fact, the consistency between what we attest to through words and what we attest to through deeds. If you give your sadaqah, that's attesting through deeds. If you say, I, I trust in Allah, uh, you know, everything is in Allah's hands, but in fact you're a, a stingy, miserable human being who is covetous of wealth, then you've got a problem. Um, you know, you could apply that to the to the entire notion of sacred space and sacred time, which I, I'm not going to get into because it, that would take us another half hour. But it, it's it, there are fascinating discourses about the, the nature of hypocrisy and the way it connects to whether, in fact, you are cognizant of sacred space and sacred time. For instance, when you don't believe that you owe salah to Allah, that you don't owe prayer five times a day to Allah, you are betraying the notion of sacred time. Because you're saying, I'm busy. That I don't have time. And Allah cannot come and carve out my time. That's a, hypo that's a, that's a hypocrisy in testimony. So you find fascinating discourses, and it breaks my heart that when I go to mosque, I don't find that that's what we're teaching our children. We're teaching our children, I don't know what the nonsense we teach them, because that's our tradition. And you know, our children think that, well, there, there's nothing else for them to learn from our tradition. Because the people teaching them are, are not competent. They're not steeped in that tradition. They're not raised with the, with the idea of anything, even coming close to the idea of sacred space and sacred time and, and wh why our relationship to time and you know, you you don't speak to them simply of all. Oh, um, the reason you you do your salah is so you don't go to hell. That reductionism is not going to appeal to anyone, and it's not going to win anyone over. Anyway, okay. Here, this deserves a pause. What time is it? So I know how long to pause. Okay. This deserves a pause. And Najd, like there's an area in Arabia called Najd, right? Um, uh, the reason it's called Najd, because that area of the Arabian plateau is elevated. Najd is an elevated place. It, Tuhama, there's another area called Tuhama, is a, a place that is actually... Uh, what's the opposite of elevated? Depression. depression. So it exists in a, in a depression. So that in, in, in Arabic, Najd is something, it refers to something that is elevated. So even a tariq al murtafi'a, an elevated road, we call it tariq najdi. So sometimes you find that in in in, in uh, Arabic literature, and it's not necessarily does it. And you find you know referring to Tariq Najdi, and it's in a sham. And they say, well, how could you refer? How, what, what are they talking about? That Tariq Najdi, in Najdi Tariq, and but it's in Syria. It's they're talking about elevated road. They're not talking about the Najd of Saudi Arabia. Okay, why is this important? Because when Allah says. Notice here the notion of elevation. What are Najdain? What are the two, two things that Allah is referring to? The path of a tariq al-khayr and tariq al-shar. 
the path of good and the path of the opposite of good or of, or evil, if you will, for the. Um, It is at the same time simultaneously Allah pointing to our attention that in fact the path, that path of good and the opposite of the path of good is plain to see. That if you understand the, the basic premise that the role of the sacred in your existence, your base self that is prone to avoidance of displeasure or lack of pleasure and the maximization of pleasure and the remembrance of the role of the divine and the intervention of the divine in your life and the role of revelation in relationship to your base self and the intervention of divinity between your perception and your testimony. So, in fact, you, you do not simply say, I believe what I see, as centuries later became the materialist philosophy of existence. I only believe what I see and what I can touch and the, the sort of empiricism philosophical empiricism and in fact the intervention of divinity in between perception and testimony that the path of good would be plain to see and that for at least the theologians who were philosophically oriented was extremely significant because one of the, the oldest debates in Islamic theology is the nature of goodness is the nature of goodness, is it something difficult for perception to understand so that revelation needs to uncover its ins and outs? Or is it sufficiently plain so that revelation only needs to point you to it, but does it need to spill out the nitty-gritty details? That's the, the, the entire debate between what we call the literalists and non-literalists can in many ways be summed up in, in that paradigm. To what extent does revelation need to spell out the path? Interestingly, for all those who belong to the Asudi method, Goodness, if you take the premises, if you understand the, the basic foundation, goodness is something that doesn't need to be spelled out. That it is fitri, it's innate within us. The innateness of creation itself. And so, it is sufficient that Allah, for, in, for instance, in, when Allah says, Allah يأمر بالعدل والإحسان, that when Allah says, I command you to do ad, justice and ihsan, that translates into inajd tabi'i, that translates into a state of goodness that we can all perceive and understand so that the words have meaning by the nature of things. Am I, am I clear or am I losing you? Obvious? Okay, good. Um... Now, that najd, that, that path of goodness, and by the way, uh, um, when uh, one of the debates that we covered in other contexts, but inshallah we will come back to because Allah taught, touches upon this quite a bit. When Allah says, وَهَدَيْنَاهُ النَّجْدَيْنِ Here, هَدَيْنَاهُ that word guided him, guided humans. Does it refer to, I've guided you to evil and good? So does evil and good come from the divine? 
or I've guided you to the ability to differentiate between evil and good. But in fact, I don't guide you to evil and good. Or at least don't guide you to evil in particular. Because the, 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 cha- the, the theological challenge was, ever, was always the role of the divine in relationship to evil. If you do evil, is it from God or from you? And that is a very big debate. The, the majority, when it comes to the vast majority, alhamdulillah, that we can, because often we can't say the vast majority about a lot of things, but the vast majority says that here it refers to we've given you the ability to differentiate, but it doesn't refer to the issue of uh, autonomy or ca- causation, ca- the, the, the issue of uh, occasionalism in philosophy, i.e., uh, your, the relationship. It doesn't talk about causal relationship and freedom. It's talking about the ability to differentiate between good and bad is from Allah. A lot of, especially I find this among undergraduates in particular and some law students. I mean, I'm talking about Muslim law students, and but, but when you know when when people want to be cool these days and age, whether undergraduates and I guess they 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 they'll say things like, well, you know, who know? Can we really differentiate between good and bad? Is there really a nature to good and bad? Do we can? What is justice? What is the good? You know, is that a meaningful question? Of course, you know. We try to teach people to be sophisticated thinkers, to teach them that to to raise the banner of justice as a cop out from answering difficult questions is not adequate and or not acceptable. So when you simply say, I want this, why? Because it's just, because it's justice. And we push you to probe whether in fact you want this because it's justice or because you are simply self-centered, self-referential, and you're projecting justice, what you want unto justice, there is a difference between teaching you to question your motives and your analytical mechanisms, your instrumentalities, and, in, and questioning the abstract concept of justice itself. There's a big difference, but that difference often younger people and special and, and even older people are, are they mix up the two and they think because they're pushed to be analytical and critical in their approach, that that means that there is no objective absolute. So you teach people to be analytical, the next thing they come, they're, they're, they're feeling cool and, and so on, and they come and say, well, you know, who knows what the truth is. That's not what, that's not what the methodology is about. That's not what the, the, the purpose of analytical methodology is about. Anyway, because as a teacher, it just it just gets really old every time, I, uh, and and it reached the point that I try to avoid meeting with undergraduates because of their cynicism, and their coolness, and uh, uh, you know too much coolness is just as beca- I've, I've developed an allergic reaction to it. So may uh, may Allah cool them away. <laughs> I started out as an undergraduate teacher, by the way, and then I, I just, okay, I, I swore off undergraduate teaching, which is too much coolness. Huh? Oh, of, oh, good question, but, okay. What time is it? Okay. Now, an obvious question that our interpreters would ask, well, if if goodness is obvious, then why does Allah 
follow that immediately by giving you illustrative examples of goodness. So Allah tells you the path of goodness is as if inajd. It's as if something that is elevated. It's something that you can see. You can you can you can notice. But then Allah gives you illustrative examples. The answer to that is al aqaba Allah gives you examples of where you diverge, you lose sight, where the biggest challenge to seeing the path of goodness is. So it, it is as if where you are most prone to go off road. That's what Allah this and that's why Allah describes it as al aqaba Al aqaba al tariq al saab is a, a path of hardship. It's an obstacle. So it's as if Allah, in fact, is telling you. Listen, there is there this this there's this hidayah from Allah to an najd. Najd al-Sawab, as they would call it in, often in books of tafsir, or Najd al-Haq, that there is this hidayah, this guidance from your Lord. But Allah recognizes that human beings often have an obstacle, a cognitive dissonance, if you will, from being able to see, to perceive what is right for what it is. And that cognitive dis- dissonance, that obstacle, that serious challenge, is as if an obstacle to the very state of salvation and grace. So when the Prophet ﷺ, in a hadith that is often cited in in this context, a man comes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, Tell me, what I can prevail upon the aqaba, what I can, how I can melt away this obstacle and enter in, in, in Jannah. And the, the, the hadith. Did I write it down or I'm going to have to freeze it? Oh. The hadith of the Prophet, then the, the Prophet says, Sadaqa aw utqu raqaba. I didn't write it down, but it's basically that, that's a Sadaqa aw utqu raqaba. That the, the real obstacle is the giving. And Muslims, modern Muslims, have turned sadaqa. They're off. I, it drives me crazy when I hear people in mosque talk about zakah as obligatory, but sadaqa is is something that is just voluntary. You do it or leave. It's as if it's a sunnah. A sadaqa is refers to any money you spend in the path of Allah. It, if it's not the obligatory zakah, then it is a sadaqa. But that doesn't mean that the sadaqah is just simply something live it, uh, give it, take it or leave it uh, as your to your heart's content. And, uh, a sadaqah is a very serious matter. The most interesting thing about commentaries of that uh, on that the issue of utqaraqaba, and I'll come to it in, in a second. But in, when about the ha- the, ha- the hadith uh, uh, about the man asking the prophet. About how do we how do we prevail upon the aqaba? How we transcend the aqaba? Is aqaba that expression? We often translate it, and I bet that this translation says the same, and probably all the translations. Um, the, uh, to, yeah, freeing a slave. To, yeah, that you free a slave. Yes, freeing a slave is aqaba. But that's not, it's not limited to freeing a slave. You've, includes paying off someone's debt. If you help someone pay off their debt, that's Atqaraqaba. That is included in it. If you help free a prisoner of war, and uh, that's Atqaraqaba. 
if you help a displaced human being find a home, that's at Quraqaba. Sufis and the philosophically oriented theologians like Ar-Razi say the most wonderful things about the notion of Atq al-Raqaba. The the the, the al literally translates as breaking the yoke around someone's neck. Literally. They say that when uh, in, it's especially in, in like tafsir in, in, in some of the Sufi uh, metaphorical um, uh, narratives, they include in Atqur Raqaba teaching someone to prevail upon their weak self and their base desires. Atqur Raqaba could include, includes freeing, so the most uh, in in Futuhat al Makiyah. Um, Ibn Arabi tells the story that he, um, I forgot what the name of his teacher was. Um, Ibn Arabi's, uh, um, I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, it's, it's, it's like that. The, the story occurs about Rumi and his teacher. Uh, does anyone, Shams, Shams, yeah. That it says, Shams, uh, and, and that image of it, the, the teacher who teaches you to pass to the Lord has liberated your neck is very common. And in fact, and, and the reason I got confused is that Ibn Arab in Futur Hatim talks a lot about Atqur Raqaba in the context of the reason I flag that, that if Muslims were taking ownership of their tradition, engaging their tradition and reinterpreting their tradition. You know, all that stuff about taqdeed al-khatab al-dini, renewing religious discourse and all that nonsense. You you want to talk, uh, talk about renewing uh, religious discourse? You take something like the concept of al raqaba and turn it into a theology of liberation, where it becomes a, a, a revolutionary message against despotism and tyranny and oppression. Now that is renewing religious discourse. But the, these despots, these dictators sitting there and telling us uh, we want Azhar to renew religious discourse, it means tell women that they don't have to wear this or tell uh, uh, men and women that they can shake hands or that it's okay to sing and dance and it's okay to have Maria Carey and I don't know who else. Yeah, that, that, you know that that is you. If Muslims did what people who take ownership of their tradition did, they would pounce on the the discourse on Atqur Raqaba as a fakku Aqaba. That it's the theology, an entire theology of liberation. Instead, we have Muslims in the modern age. Writing books about well, it's like you know we don't know if really f- uh, freeing slaves is an ethical issue because the prophet had slaves. <laughs> it is as a philosophical issue to make the yardstick on a moral issue of whether the prophet had slaves or not, and as if whether the prophet had slaves resolves the moral status of slavery means that you are, you've are you never read a book of philosophy in your life. That, that doesn't resolve anything. I'm not going to get into it now because I'm saving it for an entire discourse because it, 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 it it's so many... It, I've received so many messages from Muslims who say, I'm having a crisis of faith. I, I've read uh, uh, Jonathan's book about slavery or someone told me about Jonathan's book about slavery and uh, the prophet had slaves and this person, I now don't know if I believe anymore. I can't tell you how many messages I got like that. And then I got messages, please, please, please save us from the crisis of faith that we're having and talk about slavery 
I will, inshallah, for all the people who've written me. But when I talk about it, the issue is not whether the Prophet had slaves or not. And I will talk about why philosophically that's not the issue. And if, if anyway, let's, let's save it. But for when Allah tells us, pay attention, folks, pay attention, people. I've given you the guidance to the path, but you have, I know human beings, and I know that you have a very serious challenge. A challenge that is even an obstacle, an obstacle to salvation, an obstacle liber to liberation from your base self. What is the obstacle? Fakku raqaba. Liberation. And I will, let, let's take the, st the step of liberation of the human soul. Whether that liberation is a form of liberating a slave or the liberating of an oppressed human being or a subjugated and controlled human being. When you liberate someone from death, why, does, why is that at Qurakhaba? Because a person who is indebted is not a free person. If you have student loans or you own a lot of credit card debt, you're not a free human being. So if someone comes and pays it off, they've liberated you. Now, do you think that Allah would call paying off your debt liberation, but someone who comes and liberates you from a despotic government, Allah would say, oh, that's not at Qurakhaba. Of course it's at Qurakhaba. And a priori, if someone liberates you from foreign occupation. But these points that were rather obvious to our ancestors have become very obfuscated to the modern Muslim. So I, I, I never hear a khatib talk about at Qurakhaba in the same context as they talk about autonomy, self-determination, liberation of, of the human free will, and Islam as a message of liberation. Because when Allah tells you that I know your human weakness and that your failure to be keen on liberation, and in fact, as Ibn Arabi says, your failure, the awla al-riqab and ta'taq, what is the a priori the first liberation that you must seek. Who do you think Ibn Arabi says? Yourself. The, a priori, the first person you should liberate is yourself. And so, when Allah comes and says to you, I know that the passive guidance have been given to you. And the passive guidance is like an elevated plane. You, it's obvious. But I also know that the real obstacle is that often you are not free. A slave is not free. A person in debt is not free. An oppressed person is not free. A person who has to obey the commands of CC and been, uh, MBS and MBZ is not free. A person who's told how to think and what to say and when to say it is not free. Their ability to to have a meaningful relationship with Allah is not free. They're even told when they must uh, to renew the religion, uh, and how to renew the religion. They're not free. And by the way, that's why Islam was revealed to, in in to the tribe of Quraysh because Arabs might have been a vulgar people, but they were also very autonomous, jealously free people. The, that why Islam was revealed to, to the Arabs and not to the Persians and not in Egypt and not in Ethiopia because all these regions were under the tutelage of rulers. The spot where you didn't have a ruler in control. I, in another occasion, I'll tell you stories about how Arabs failed for centuries to appoint a king every time someone would attempt to bring them all under the umbrella of a single king. Their rebellious and unruly nature would prevent that. But that's exactly what made them the best recipient, best vehicle for Islam. Because Islam can grow with free human beings. If you're not free, there are various aqabat, obstacles for Islam to grow within you.
liberate yourself. If Ibn Arabi was sitting with us today, he would, he would tell you, I will tell you the entire halaqa, all of this was a waste of time. <laughs> I only need 10 seconds from your time. Fukku rikabakum. Break the yoke around your neck, now go home. <laughs> okay. فَلَقْتَحَمَا فَكُّ رَقَبَا أَوْ إِطْعَامٌ فِي يَوْمٍ ذِي مَسْغَبَةٍ يَتِيمًا ذَا مَقْرَبَا أَوْ مِسْكِينًا ذَا مَطْرَبَا We're not going to finish the surah tonight. I'm really sad. I'm really sorry. Now, a yatim and a miskin. And I'm, I'm going... A yatim and the apri an orphan, the greatest form of shame and the greatest accountability that you have before Allah. While you might have while might you might not be held responsible. And, and again, I'm talking about what, what you find in the various theologians had said. The biggest responsibility with it is an, an orphan that exists within your family that has not been taken care of. That, remember that the Prophet ﷺ himself was an orphan within his family. Everything in the Prophet's life was for a reason and for a moral lesson and an ethical reason, including his, his, the, the death of his parents, the death of his children, everything. In Islamic Sharia, which again is one of these parts that we never talk about, you never find anyone, for an orphan to exist in a family, in, in, the, in the old jurisprudence, you can in fact the, sue an uncle or an aunt or a cousin or a relative and hold them financially responsible for failure to take care of an orphan. You can't do that in modern law. You can't even do that in Saudi law. That part of Hanbali law was not adopted in Saudi. If you, make, if you file a lawsuit like that, it's dismissed for lack of standing even in Saudi. So that part of Sharia didn't survive into the modern age, but that doesn't change the fact that the moral responsibility is extremely heavy. If you have, for all of those, because I know that these, you know, the halakas get around, if there is an orphan in your family, it is a heavy sin for, for the family to fail to take care of that orphan. You might have an excuse if that is not a family relationship by telling Allah, well, I didn't know about the orphan. Well, I, I had other, you know, I had to take care of family members. I had to take care of neighbors. But an orphan within the family, now I underscore that because I, I, it's, it's, it's remarkable, but I, even within my own family, the, the, the extended family, you find orphans and you find that the family often talks as if it's an option, it's choice, whether they are taken care of or not. That is an ethics that is completely foreign to Islam. So when, when Allah reminds us, when Allah underscores an orphan of that nature and describes it as an aqaba, it's one of these a priori moral issues that is a serious obstacle to a further development of your divine essence or your ethical sense or your taqwa in, in, in is I try to avoid Islamic um, dogma as much as I can so that it translates into something that the modern human being can relate to. So it's, it's a serious obstacle to your... The second is the miskin and the matraba. What time is it? Okay, I'll finish with the matraba. A miskin is someone who is in need. 
the the thing that is is that deserves again Quranic expression and Quranic usage. Why did the Quran use matraba? We know that matraba comes from the word tarib. Tarib means someone who is weakened and exhausted. From that word tarib comes the word turba for, actually it's the opposite. Tarib, the word tarib came from the word turba. That's right. Turba comes the, is, is soil. A tarib, supposedly a person who is weak and exhausted, especially for the Arabs of the desert, was someone who would become dusty. From as if from from travel. The matraba literally would be a poor person who state in need as if the, 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 the image is very powerful. It's as if their state of need have reduced them to an unkept state where they became dusty and messy. It's as if as if they, they, they have become mixed with the dust. Now, it's not literal. If, if the literalists, by the way, and again, alhamdulillah, that it's a minority view, they said that when the Quran said Miskina Zamat Raba, it was referring to a poor person in Medina. Again, don't put any weight on that narrative, but just in the, to be completely, if you were in a an hadith type school, they would have taught you like this book, for instance, which is printed in Saudi. It says that there was a Miskin in Medina who used to lie down and on the path and the, and the road, and he was so poor that often people couldn't tell the difference between him and the dust that covered him. And that's the Quran, that's the person that the Quran is referring to when it says, Miskin and Zamatraba. Now, give me a break. So, the Quran, can you imagine with the state a poor person would have to be in to become indistinguishable from the dust of the road? I mean, you would have to be starving to the point that you're just not moving for so long. You're dying, basically. You're half dead, right? And you're so covered by dust that people passing, coming and going, they, they can't tell the difference between you and the dust. Now, so the people who perpetuated this, this narration basically wanted a cop-out. Sorry to be very blunt, but we're out of time. In other words, they wanted to invent a story that would say, well, you know, it's talking about people who are really starving. You know, they, 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 they're starving to the point that they fall on the road and they no longer are mobile. Alhamdulillah, that the vast majority called it as it is and said that's nonsense. The matraba means that a, a poor person don't... The, you, the, 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 Evidence of poverty is not the person saying, I am poor. But it's what you observe from the state of hardship that befalls a person. And it is so eloquently, and again, if, if the, the expression of the Quran is miraculous, it's so eloquently described in this simple few words, miskin and zamat raba. It told you everything. You observe a human being you notice that they look way down. They look dispossessed. They look displaced. They live in, in horrible conditions. That is sufficient. That is the matraba. That is the hardship it is talking about. That, that is sufficient to then trigger the obligation to overcome the akaba. That, that serious obstacle. It is not a registry, and it is not a declaration. Among the narratives, again, that is interesting, is when an emir reportedly in Baghdad, in the Abbasid period, I, I don't know if this is actually historical, but it's, it's what people report, 
the reason you suspect it's not historical because the emir is not named. Uh, other than the fact that he was in the period in, in, during the time of Harun al-Rashid, that he wanted to make a registry of poor people so that rich people would know who to give the sadaqah to. And the, the fuqaha of Baghdad said that is demeaning and deprecating to have a registry of poor people. That the 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 idea of a registry of poverty is inconsistent with the dignity of human beings. The, the, what you take from the historical narrative is far more important than whether it's actually happened or not. That's the, the moral lesson from it is far more significant. I think that's really interesting to, when you compare it with the way that poverty is dealt with in the modern age as a state problem. And as if because the state collects taxes and becomes responsible supposedly for the poor, then it takes the burden off the wealthy. Okay, let's stop here. So, inshallah, next halakha, we will finish. We don't have much left in Surah Al-Bad, but the reason I cannot jump over is because I remembered Tawasaw Bissabr wa Tawasaw Bil Marhama, we have to pause because I have to, very interesting things to talk about when we say Tawasaw Bil Marhama. So, uh, uh, that will take us a little bit and then we move on, inshallah, to Surah Al-Fajr. I have to start Surah Al-Fajr. Inshallah, <laughs> 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 Inshallah. Um, so let's stop here. Alhamdulillah. <laughs>